you know, if Josh sees an astronaut landing on Mars in a, in a crew module that he machined, that this astronaut is in, man, what purpose does that bring in meaning to what he does? Looking out beyond what anyone could ever see in space through this telescope, uh, building giant 3D printers that print things bigger than anyone's ever printed before. I mean, there's so much potential and meaning and purpose in what we do here that's beyond normal day-to-day -day activity. In the silent heights of the Chilean Andes, one of the world's most powerful land-based telescopes is taking shape, and it starts here in Rockford, Illinois. Chosen from a global field, Ingersoll Machine Tools is building the giant Magellan Telescope's 2,000-ton precision mount. And we were not the, the lowest cost supplier, but GMTO felt that we were really the only ones worldwide that had the ability to manufacture these kind of structures to these kind of tolerances. A feat of engineering unlike anything attempted before. No other U.S. company could deliver the size, accuracy, and ingenuity required. It's a new frontier for astronomy and for American manufacturing. Okay, Jeff, we are standing in front of a massive pit, but I know it's much more than that. Can you just tell me where we are and what we're looking at? Yep. So this is a building that was added just for the telescope project. The pit represents the foundation of the telescope. It's not as deep as the foundation will be, but if you look at on the wall, you kind of see the, the rendering of the telescope. The concrete part represents this level down here. The lower purple area is the asthma track, which are a couple of them are shown over there. We'll walk around and see them in a little bit. On top of that is the azimuth disk structure, which holds the hydrostatic bearings. And then the purple horseshoe represents the elevation axis. On top of the purple horseshoe are the first primary mirror cells going up to the secondary mirror cells. Now, to give you a perspective of the size, when we, when we have the azimuth disk structure with the elevation axis on top, without the mirror cells, and we rotate that 60 degrees, we're up on the rafters of this building. All right, uh, so we're sitting in front of the largest gantry-style five-axis mill in the country, is that correct? Can somebody just talk about why this machine was built and what its purpose is in regard to the telescope project? Yeah, so the machine was built for the purpose of being able to manufacture the very large components of the telescope that don't fit on another machine. We have very large machines in the back of the plant, but none of them big enough for the mirror cells, the C-rings, the three asthma tracks when we machine them together. So this had to be sized for those very large components, but it's an also a very important asset for our, our uh, national defense because of the the articles we can do on this machine for our government. These, these blocks that are stationed, yep. can you talk about those? So these are our spring box, uh, that's the foundation hardware that the, the whole mount sits on. I like to call it elephant on ice gates because it's got very thin steel plates, uh, blue steel plates, which give it the ability to allow the telescope to breathe thermally as the load goes over the top. As the hydrostatic pads carry the weight, it allows that difference in temperature from the floor to the, to the uh, steel to allow it to grow without shifting. It also allows in a seismic event, allows it to move sideways, but it's vertically, it'll hold the load without flexing. You know, th this, this is expensive. And this is, this is not easy to make. This is like a 50 year design, that's the last 50 years. Every time we come up with an idea to simplify, it came with a challenge of, well, it's gonna do this and it's gonna do that. We can't live with that, we can't live with that. So throughout this process, you have to control contamination, you have to control burrs, you have to control rust. And so it comes to Ingersoll, we grind it all perfectly, take it all apart, 
deburr, you know, polish it, wow. and then pat, repackage it together, send it to a, a plater, which does their operation to it, does their operation to it, comes back to Ingersoll, then we have to take it all apart again and then process it and assemble it all oh together. Goodness. Just looking at That's all the bolts in here, every one of them you'll see a, a green mark on it. Rob and his team had to go and we, they assembled all these together and specifically torqued and retorqued every single bolt in a, a sequence. sequence because you, you want to pull it together so it was a sequence it took a couple tries to get it so we got the sequence right yeah. so if you can just imagine all these bolts in that process of, of that happening 224 times <laughs> like jeff said it's not like something we haven't done before we're just stretching the limits of things we, we did before pieces are larger sometimes a little bit more complex but we've been doing these kind of complex parts for years been a challenge, but we've met the challenge. Well, I think what makes this different than most everything we build, it's in the round. Most everything we do, as you've seen in our machines, are linear, and most machine tools have a linear bed and, and, and three axis at least. Building something in a, in a, in a round, in a circle, is, is, is extremely difficult because the angle's got to be precise, and when you get around to the other side, yes. everything has to match up. Yes. And we're talking about a hydrostatic surface where the surface that we're, we're going to be riding on over the entire surface is going to be within 300 microns, the entire surface. Wow. That's a small number, such a large area that it has to encompass. So as, yeah, as, as Rob mentioned, 57,000 pounds worth of steel here. Um, this is a, a, a vertical uh, elevation hydrostatic way. This is the second way over here. And then this is the radial way that we talked about. We finish as an assembly in the pit. From a fabrication standpoint, along with all the very tight constraints of the welds, from, from this end, the thickness of this way, from this end to the other end, cannot vary more than about 13 millimeters. The process of fabricating something this big and hold it to a half inch tolerance on flatness yes, yes. when it wants to move and bend with all this mass uh, was quite a learning curve for us and the fabricators. Um, we went through the process of straightening and the, and the stress furnace multiple times, figuring out why it was going on, making changes in the fabrication process so we could minimize the amount of, of deflection. Using our experience, we know how to manage large components. So uh, with something this large, we minimize the times we have to move it, roll it. We use gravity as our friend and, and use these uh, principles, reduce the number of times we have to move the part and it makes it more accurate, more repeatable. Plus two, we learned it through, throughout that process, we learned that uh, we were able to bend this to the way we wanted it prior to it becoming a double box structure. So we learned that we were able to weld it to a certain operation in the welding process, bring it here to Ingersoll, bend it then, and, and even put a little bit of English into it. Yeah, some people call that compensation and some of us call it Kentucky windage we put in. <laughs> Kentucky what? Windage. Each of these welds or each of these tracks have a personality of themselves. So we, we knew that we learned the tendencies of, of the welding process and what it actually did naturally. And we were able to kind of prevent that from happening earlier in the phase. So this is the azimuth disc structure that will ride on top of the azimuth tracks with the hydrostatic bearings being underneath. And then uh, the elevation bearings go on top. Um, Underneath, we have these white brackets here, which will hold the radial hydrostatic bearings. That corner piece is this piece right here. This is one of them. Wow. 
So this is the this is the bottom side. It's upside down right now. It'll have four hydrostatic bearings and one, five earthquake five dampening. earthquake dampening systems that will engage when we start to sense seismic activity. So they will they will they'll be like a shock absorber. They'll they'll be retracted, and as soon as there's a seismic event detected, it'll spring down onto the hydrostatic way and act as a shock absorber to take out that that shake. I'm trying to imagine the 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 brainstorming that goes into processes like this. Does this group been part of that that iteration and brainstorming process? So the our OHB partners do a lot of the mechatronics. The they they develop this with a supplier. Our our part was how do we get that? How do we machine for that? How do we install that? Be able to get it in and out if it has to be maintained or whatever. So, and they did some very serious practical practical type testing. For, oh, yeah. for both those and the hydrostatic. Um, this is another case where we're, when we were machining this, this has stiffeners where it needs it and not stiffeners where it doesn't. And we had some oil canning of the, the non-critical surfaces, which weren't, didn't affect the performance, but we got to run pipe and wire along this thing to all the bearings and stuff. So we learned from the first one, added some additional stiffeners inside for the, for the next ones. Um, Again, this is, this is very, very tightly controlled from a point of fabrication to machining to understand where the stock conditions are. Everything has to be laser tracked to see where we have stock. All of these components have to be small enough to fit on the truck, on the vessel that's going to carry them, mm -hmm. right? To what degree did that wow. influence? <laughs> that's why we have eight tracks instead of four. <laughs> Just factoring in all of, of the features that we just talked about, knowing in advance that they're going to be needed well down the line, how do you do that? Uh, it's, it's kind of a tribal knowledge of, of just learning through experience. Our, our team is, is very unique. You know, we all have a, a, a little bit of area of expertise, but we all gel really nicely because what Jeff doesn't know, I know, or Todd knows, or Rob, or Giovanni, who's not here. You know, so it's a collaboration of everybody using what they know. You know, part of the story is clearly um, that this level of uh, capability and engineering is, is possible in the United States, and, and as far as keeping that knowledge and capability in this country, are, are you bringing younger folks in to kind of so you, they can be the next version of this team. Oh, yeah. They're going to be here after we're gone for sure. So, yeah, we've got uh, we've got engineers that, that uh, we involve in different aspects of this. Um, they're going to be a, you know a lot of people involved in the assembly uh, that'll become the experts to go to in the field and carry that knowledge of how we put it together here to repeat it in the field. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, this is not just about advanced manufacturing. It's it's demonstrating world-changing science instruments uh, and that they can still be built in the United States. So what does that mean to each of you? For me, I've spent a lifetime in special machines and I, I love and I'm passionate about just building things that are, are, make a difference in the world. But what makes the biggest difference for me is when my four-year-old grandson comes back from school with a picture that he showed his class of um, him and his Paca, they call me Paca, uh, looking and he, he drew a telescope and it was looking out at stars and he's only four years old and, and he's fascinated by this. Um, that makes the most difference to me is because the next generation, it'll be important to them. And to me, it's, uh, it's really a sense of purpose and meaning uh, in what we do here. You know, I, you, you could go to a shop and do the same thing every day and, and, and it has purpose and meaning, but the, in the bigger picture, if you think, if, you know, if Josh sees an astronaut landing on Mars in a, in a crew module that he machined, that this astronaut is in, man, what purpose? does that bring in meaning to what he does? Uh, looking out beyond what anyone could ever see in space, 
through this telescope, uh, building giant 3D printers that print things bigger than anyone's ever printed before. I mean, there's so much potential and meaning and purpose in what we do here that's beyond normal day-to-day -day activity.